All right, welcome back to another uh, stream for Unreal. And uh, we've got a few things I want to do today. So it's going to be a good day, I think, hopefully. <laughs> got Paul here already. Welcome, Paul. I saw you message hello before I even got going. I was very early there. Um, so we have a few cool ideas. Uh, first of all, I just want to take a look at some of the, the free asset of the medieval level that showed up in my email today. Uh, that's got a lot of free content that uh, looks pretty exciting. Definitely want to take a look at what it is. I haven't actually looked at it yet. I just have it open. It's been loading, carefully loading the background for the last, uh, I don't know, it took me about 15 minutes to load it. So it hopefully it's going to run fine. But I haven't actually looked at it yet. So I'm waiting for the surprise. And uh, I'm looking for a new backdrop anyway. So this might actually be the new backdrop. I'm thinking it might be kind of a cool thing if we can get like a fire in the background or some sort of campfire or something going on change it up move on from the Christmas theme that I've got going on here um, especially now that we've gotten past our deep freeze here at uh, in Canada uh, or at least I'm hoping we're past it so we got that and we also have a, uh, a bit of game logic ideas that we're gonna do to help one of uh, my students projects so that he can we can share the knowledge and the experience as I try to fix the issue and um, talk about some stuff that uh, transferring variables between levels so a little bit of technicality and a little bit of fun stuff um a whole python idea that i was going to do for my stream uh facial um capturing streaming thing i need at least an hour of de deep development time before i start talking about that in my stream again because i am really in a sticky point there so i did not get an hour of development time today so it's this is me uh kind of winging it as usual what do you specialize in Simon? Is it animation or are you more of a generalist? I started as an animator, so I'm definitely animation is my uh, is my base that I got into the industry with um, character animation, and then I got into technical animation, and uh, and I found lots of opportunity as a technical animator. So it really became a strong element of what I do, and then uh, and then I got at I went from Silicon Knights to Rocksteady as a tech, senior technical animator and then I uh, was able to work on facial motion capture and stuff like that. So um, really got deep into the technical side of it and uh, and specifically in the animation element. But then when I started mentoring for CG Spectrum, I really got into much more departments with modeling and all kinds of stuff. Um, and now I'm a ridiculous generalist of all sorts of directions. Especially now that I'm getting it unreal. Uh, what's the difference between animating and technical animating? Uh, animation, they, they both, well, okay, so a technical animator needs animation skill set um, and, uh, <laughs> and animating is just kind of like you really hone your skills on, uh, you know, facial animation, body animation. Uh, capturing the the thought process and the mood and stuff so it's very very you can definitely specialize just in animation and understand the skill but from my perspective I'm dealing with like you know are the chains moving around does we have to worry about fabric issues are we animating some kind of weird object that needs a special custom rig um, you know is there a skinning issue or do we need fabric I mean a trace of fabric like some it's, it's kind of mixes into like VFX it kind of mixes into solving any kind of technical issue uh, particularly at Rocksteady was the facial uh, motion capture that we needed to get onto our characters and uh, so that was kind of my area that I had to sort of master and uh, but I also took on like tons of other technical things and building tools that's another big one uh, making that life easier for the animators building pipelines for them so that they can get their job done i think that's really where the being an animator as a technical animator comes in handy because you're not just asking the animator for what their tool is that they want you already know what they want or you know where the bottleneck is so then you're able to make that tool to solve that problem even if they haven't even asked for it yet um and i think that's where i was really uh, happy that i had that animation background before i got into that Sarah's here. Welcome, Sarah. Sarah's aw Simon is awesome. That's, that was nice of you. Uh, and, and Paul says, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I definitely recommend people getting into technical fields. That's, that's a general thing from the school. We all want to get into 
see if we can get everybody into a technical field because there's lots of opportunity in that direction and uh, it's just a great all-around skill set it's just really hard that's the downside all right so today what we're going to do is talk about uh this medieval game environment and uh take a look at it for the first time so we've got some pretty cool looking scenes a lot of this assets are coming from um quixel from what i was reading i don't know where i saw that <laughs> uh mega scans there we go um, so yeah, I feel like we might be able to come up with a cool backdrop if we want, if we're looking for one that might uh, relate to uh, something a little different than what I've got now. It's a little dreary of a scene with that fogginess, but um, if we can get a nice campfire in there or something that might be cool. Anyways, we'll see. Uh, so I've got it here in the background. Um, that's not it. Here it is. So we'll put it back. I'll get back into real time, and we'll uh, we'll turn off all the the game stuff by hitting G so I can actually take a look around now but I still haven't actually seen what this environment's about yet just had it loading in the background here um, so one of the things that I, I also want to cover while I'm doing this is talking about some of the cinematic rendering that I learned about last week I wanted to cover Paul Simon sorry if this is off-topic I have a question feel free to ask questions I like answering questions it's kind of what the stream is for um, my next animation assignment and it's pantomime. Uh, how many frames would you say it should stick between? And also, what is pantomime? Why did you throw that word? You just put me on the spot there. That's great. Thanks for throwing in a really complicated word I never use. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Huh? That was a good one. I gotta remember that. Um, how many frame, frames would you uh, say it should stick between? So, I don't really have much information about what the actual animation assignment is, but if you're trying to animate something that, uh, like basically the timeline I usually work with when I'm in Maya is just around 100 frames. Um, otherwise it just gets too ridiculously tiny. So I would just be worrying about 100 frame chunks at a time. Uh, and just work your way through those but it really depends on what you're trying to do because you could potentially need hundreds of frames or you could potentially only need 50 frames but um i would not be talking like thousands of frames because then you're just going to be busy for a really long time sarah says i learned how to animate and add mocap to uh oh learn how to animate and add mocap uh using the control rig in unreal in the last two weeks and that's what I got from my work experience <laughs> so pretty excited about having a new skill set under my belt yes exactly and you decided to take on a fairly complex um, well it wasn't your decision which you had to take on a fairly complex uh, challenge there where you're taking and you're retargeting mocap using a control rig or just using anything in Unreal with mocap um, there's a, at least three different ways to do it. Um, and if it was me, I would have taken the motion builder route, but that requires a whole nother software that uh, you may not have learned yet. So that it would have been a, a very big challenge to learn the software on the fly. The other route could have been with the HIK using, you know, basically the same rig as motion builder, but using it in Maya and uh, working with the existing skeleton and, and retargeting there. And the route that you took was using Unreal, which is definitely possible nowadays, um, where you can actually uh, you know, use your retargeting tools inside of Unreal and also now the control rig, which is inside of Unreal. However, I find that one a fairly experimental uh, path to take because uh, you, you um, a lot of these tools are just sort of really released recently and I find that the retargeting within Unreal sometimes gives you un, uh, results that aren't that great but your job was to try to get motion capture in there and then on something you could animate on top of so that's that's another added layer of complexity. Sarah says the studio hasn't updated to 4.26 yet oh yes so that see that right away is gonna hold you back from uh, be able to to accomplish your goal and that is common too to have a studio not quite 
on the latest technology and uh the um it's a very complex roof though isn't it the uh the the control rig is very very experimental i i wouldn't be sort of choosing that path very lightly uh that would be like a it's very very experimental until i feel comfortable with it in fact that was something that i was considering doing today was um talking about how to animate and control rig if i run out of stuff to talk about but uh i've got quite a lot of things i want to do today so these are nice trees they're pretty cool they got kind of a very unique look to them Sarah says there were uh, just so many technical issues and I was getting behind in uni, so I had super glad, super glad the job didn't work out. Well, to be quite honest, if you have a job, then uni takes second place, I would say. I mean, I know that doesn't sound like an awesome thing when you spent money on a school, but in my opinion, it's like school is secondary to the actual job. I mean, I know it sounds obvious, but it's, it's at the same time, it, it can be misleading um, but realistically actual work experience is hugely valuable and you wouldn't want to underestimate that I'm really curious to know it looks like these are these mosses are just pieces of geometry I was thinking it was like some kind of crazy awesome shader but they're just merging in and they've got this cool material that loves anything that intersects to kind of soften soften the uh the transition in there so that you can allow for that nice smooth effect without having that sharp edge and that is actually part of the material uh let's see if i can get to the material here pixel depth offset there i think that's what it is not too complicated to put in but it, it does have a nice feature we usually do it for like if you have a flame fire effect on a sprite or something you can get it to feel like it's uh softly blended into the ground instead of just a sharp cut edge this is a pretty awesome level there's a lot of detail here i'm just i'm not even sure how much of i've looked at it but i'm just like pretty overwhelmed by how much content just unique looking content that's coming on here should try to start breaking this down a little bit to find out like these would be duplicated stairs this looks like it's like it's just a piece of big chunk of geometry here mixed with some little pieces put on top i really like the way that like shimmers off the rocks that is very cool Oh, we got a big windmill up here. This is a fairly nice windmill asset. <laughs> Definitely, uh... That's probably just in the Quixel library. Ooh, look, we got a pile of smoke over here. Let's see what that's all about. Firsty's here. Hey, welcome. Hey, Simon, hope you're well. At Paul, I don't know if this helps, but my friends at do Panto, and it's basically very theatrical acting without speaking to a lot of the time. Hey, thanks, Christy, for answering that for me. Because I was literally going to have to do a Google search. I did not know the answer. So... Where are these assets from? Okay, I can, I can answer that. Um, so this came in an email today. It's a uh, medieval game environment. It's free asset you can download. Uh, it's like 15 gigabytes, so, so it's quite large. But um, yeah, I just got that in the email today. So it's not actually part of like the monthly free stuff. It's a bit of a unique thing that just came. This smoke looks like it's, uh, oh no, it's a part of, it's just a sprite sheet. I was gonna say, it looks like some kind of crazy volumetric um, Niagara effect, but it's just a uh, 
particle simulation potentially done in like Houdini or something as a spreadsheet. Oh, it usually is a big fireball. Okay. Interesting. Or maybe I grabbed the wrong one, I don't know. Kinda cool. Must loop nicely too, although I don't really know where that is. There's some nice tricks for looping apparently, but I don't know. Mostly it's just about blending your start and end, I think. Why is there a red light over here? Weird. Alright, let's see if we can get to that campfire part. Alright, we just have a fire in the bushes. Oh, I see. We've got a whole bunch of burning stuff here. I thought this was going to be a campfire, but it turns out it's just burning ruins. <laughs> so maybe that's not such a great backdrop after all. I'd have to make my own little campfire if I was going to do that. I got some assets to work with, I guess. Nice that these people are lighting those candles in the middle of the day like this. Ooh, we got a little cemetery over here. Okay. That's not creepy. Exposure is really nice on the lighting. Um, we're getting really nice, like, even though we're getting some, like, light and dark areas, it's it, the darkness is still, like, exposing really nice. I know it's something I was really challenged with trying to get my lighting to <clears throat> have nice shadow areas. So we should take a look at some of the lights and see what kind of... Uh... Oh, what's this? Commentary. Oh, maybe I should play the level. I didn't thought of that. Put the fires out. <laughs> you must be from Australia. Oh man, I hope this is going to kill my computer. I just hit the play button, so we'll see. It's definitely caused everything to freeze. My computer is, by the way, feeling pretty hot, or at least sounding pretty hot over there. There we go. Alright, we have... It's a nice little scene there. Oh look, they're doing the, the jump around and the fade in and fade out. That's pretty cool. Those are the kind of shots I'm looking for, but maybe not so, uh... I don't know how loud this is for you guys. Turn that down a little bit. Alright, we're gonna do play and see what happens here. Hmm. It was kind of a nice little sequence. Am I in the cemetery? That would be hilarious. No. Oh, there sure is a lot of stuff going on. All kinds of like leaves falling. Lots of variation in the vegetation. The walking speed is nice and slow. Oh look, it's the cornfield. I mean a wheat field. There's the uh wheelbarrow. Oh. I'm kinda curious to know how they're making that radiant hill like that on the side. Can't actually walk. Oh, I can't kind of walk over there. Oh, I've kind of broken it a little bit. Wow, oh. that's quite nice. Should have went full screen. <laughs> I'm looking inside of a window and inside of a window. Hey, there's a bird animation. Bird is not getting anywhere. 
The other one seemed to have flown away. Oh, I was going to say, I think that one's supposed to fly away too. I bet you there's something cool going on there. We should check that out. See what the blueprints are. Whoa, it just took a 90 degree angle turn there. Oh, it feels like the uh, sun is just going away now. Pretty good. Oh, here's a campfire thingy. It's like a blacksmith. Ah, oh, it's really foggy in there. <laughs> Look, we got another stuck bird. I don't know what I did wrong, but I messed up all the birds. this actually a mission in this game or not like is it just a look around and enjoy yourself oh look I can't go that way it's not letting me go past this log or is there actually like a, a start and an end it did say play in the beginning of the menu oh, it really has gotten darker like either it's always gonna get darker or it's actually changing as I progress through the level that would be kind of a cool feature it's like decidingly changing wow it's really burning over here Sarah says, you remind me of a kid in a toy shop. Oh, look at the birdies on the campfire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I am a little bit, actually, at the moment. It's kind of fun. <laughs> wow, there was actually stuff going on. This is great. I don't know what it is. I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to do. I feel like I now have to f play along with whatever the mission is. But I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. Maybe that was it. It's just a little scare. Or maybe I've gotten myself stuck by mistake. I don't know. I, c I can't jump, so I'm pretty much limited to whatever I can do on the floor here. That was cool, though. I do kind of feel like that's the end of it. Because I, I don't know where else I'm supposed to be here. Interesting that this light is blue. It's like an interactive museum. It says Audrey. Nice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, if you were in some VR set, this would be a lot of fun. You got some really nice uh, environment music, too, going on. I am supposed to go over here or something. I am getting a little disoriented. I may have been here before, I, I'm not sure. This like, the rags blowing in the wind? Oh no, those are just leaves. I was like, those are great, like, for just... Like, looking like something, and then you're like, oh no, that's not actually anything. Anyway, it's super cool. There's a lot of fun stuff in here. Like, it's just such nice detail. So let's go explore a little more in terms of what it does. Yes, <laughs> clearly the lighting did change a little bit. It went from one to the next. 
Uh, let's see. Let's see what the lighting is since we're talking about it. Oh, we got the volumetric clouds going on. The ones I never actually did get working or try yet, so. Oh, where are they here? Volumetric clouds. That's that new feature that came out in 4.26 that uh, makes these clouds look cool. Maybe I can take a closer look. Oh, they actually don't look like I can ever get to them. <laughs> Maybe I could just move over to them, but maybe that's how they're, they're designed to be. Let's change some of these sliders. <clears throat> oh, yeah, no, they do actually work. Cool, you can really, like, change their height. Oh, those are really nice. Oh, that's like your uh, distance, or clipping distance. That's cool. Yeah, you got really high clouds or really low clouds. Really, you can change like the thickness of the clouds and everything too. Or is it all part of this material? A material instance with a bunch of variables, and I don't know what they would do or how you'd tell what they're doing. Maybe I could change one of them. No idea. Anyway, um. I actually came to find out what the uh, lighting was, so <laughs> I haven't got there yet. Shadow tracing distance. Huh, that's cool. Planet radius. Doesn't seem to have any effect, so clearly. We're not getting to see the horizon very well. Okay. And sky atmosphere. Uh, it's probably a fancy new feature I don't know about either, so... We could try playing with something here as well. Atmosphere height. Oh, yeah. Sky atmosphere. Man, I've never used sky atmosphere. That must be new. Or did it come with the... Uh... No, it comes with 4.26. Or maybe was part of the sun part. The sky sun. Hmm. Should have used that last week. Actually, one thing I learned about last week we were talking about, uh, we were trying to light somebody's animation and uh, inside of Unreal. And uh, I couldn't get my lighting right. And it turns out I was totally on the wrong path. Uh, well, I don't know if I was on the wrong path, but... Um, after the stream, I ended up changing my lighting completely, so it was like, uh, basically the, the light object I was using, which if I can find it here, I will be able to show you what I'm talking about. But the lighting object what I was using was exposing really, really bright, and, um, I don't know, there's just too many objects in here. Is that maybe the sky atmosphere also the sunlight? Let me just check here. So what I discovered was that inside of that sky, sun sky object that I created, 
uh, I was able to get inside of that and separate out the different objects. So one of them was the actual light source. That was what I was supposed to do. And I went off and couldn't find it for the entire stream until afterwards. And I was like, what the... Let me see if I can reproduce this. Audrey, oh, the cat in the window. Yes, well, there's a little fox, actually. Um... Yeah, we did that one stream in December there. Got the fox rigged up and animated. Put him in there. Um, is it an AR Sky? Maybe this is the object. Now I'm confused. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're starting to get in the different season now. So I actually am looking actively for a new backdrop. Even though the fox is a lot of fun. I have to come up with another animal or something. A fox? Oh wow, I need to change my glasses. <laughs> yeah. He don't worry, he'll be back. Every minute comes back, looks in the house. I cannot find this object of sun that I was using before, so clearly I am super lost because sky atmosphere may have been what I was using before. But it, it just doesn't look correct because um, I'm looking for the way it was broken down. I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe I have to. Maybe it's a plug-in that has to be loaded. Or was it part of AR Skylight? Let's see if I can load up. Maybe I should load up that actual project. If I still have it here. Oh, um, that's. Oh shoot, what's going on here? Sorry. I'm hearing the noises of things disconnecting and I'm like, what is happening? Alright, um, so anyway, Kieran, who had the uh, animation project from last week, uh, did actually do a much better job of uh, doing the lighting and fix it up. So that was really cool. I'm going to see if I can pull that up right now. And uh, did some updates to the uh, demo reel. Hopefully I'm not going to do disservice to the, uh, the reel here. But we've got a bunch of interesting animations and then the, the scene that we did last week is going to be in there as well. But we got a cool little uh, start um, title screen is fun then we've got this running animation with some improvements in the lighting and the focus and um, we got the explosion in there and then we've got this scene which is the uh, one of the other uh, mechanical or advanced mechanic body rigs that are available from the CG Spectrum library that come from the Figgins models and uh, so they're all animated and working on Unreal because they've all got these are game ready characters so managed to get them working in the Unreal and here's the scene that we worked on last week but got uh, drastically improved by the lighting uh, from Kieran but uh, this is the one we were trying to use the lights and what I discovered to get those effects to be blue again I really had to like change my exposure Bring it back down and I discovered that the light that I was using was um, could have been modified in a, in a much easier way I really should go back to this file here we have a couple things we want to do today Let's see if I can get to that one though just so I can wrap up what we were talking about and make sure I pass over some of the lessons learned uh, and then we'll just keep this project going because I'm pretty sure I'm going to try I, What I would like to know is like how... Oh, I was trying to figure out the sunlight. I never did figure that out. Can't tell if it's from the sky or from um, another object. See if I can start minimizing anything. Menu. While I'm waiting for this other file to load. Particles. Oh, we got some uh, Niagara particles in here. Rips. Oh yeah. I don't even 
even see anything dripping. Well, let's just do a search for lights. Oh, there's some. Spotlights, lots of spotlights. Point lights. It's very hard to find things when you're like, not sure, but there's a thousand objects. Here's a directional light. Alright, it's just a directional light. It doesn't seem quite as exciting as I expected here. It was set to 12,000 lumens. Whoops, 12,000. Uh, and I wonder what the exposure is. Ah, see, they're doing the same thing. So this is the same problems I had in the stream before, where the exposure is insanely high, um, and the lighting is super bright. It's like way beyond what normally you get for video game defaults. Um, and so my problem was that some of my particle effects that were created in Cascade were coming up black, which was not uh, very favorable. So I had to actually figure out how to adjust it all. And, uh, and actually, if you change your uh, exposure to manual, how am I going to do this? <laughs> if you do it, you just got to trust me here. Uh, let's see if we can find uh, exposure. Oh no, it's still using auto exposure. But if you switch it to manual, um, it also makes it really, really dark. So I'm surprised that they're not switching it to exposure manual. Um, but maybe, maybe it's the game camera that the player character uses is uh, is the one. But I don't know. Right now, I should be using that setting. So who knows what's going on? But Sometimes what you're doing is, you know, what I could have done was switch to the manual and it matched the exposure of default sun directional light, but let's go to this other project so I can show you what I'm talking about here. Here's the, uh, the one that I was working on before I gave it back to Kieran and we got the, the blue, uh, splashes working again. And now the, the, the sun and sky object, which is, I was trying to find, I could not find it in the other one for some reason. All my sun objects are inside of the components, and I didn't realize that until after the stream was over. But like your directional light is in here, and then you can change uh, the intensity of your light to match it to be more of like a normal, natural exposure level. Uh, and that way it was more in line with what the VFX were supposed to be showing for their emissive strength. So that was kind of good to know in the end. And then the other thing that I learned, which is something I wanted to cover today anyways, was uh, how the rendering works. So uh, I used Movie Render Q at the end, and I know I didn't really talk about it much when I was uh, at the stream because I didn't really know much about it. But I was really shocked to find out the results of Render Movie Q are so much better than um, than what you get from using the rendering inside a sequencer. So and it's fairly easy to use. So in this case, I'm just going to grab um, the name of the, I think it's this one, I would assume, the name of the sequence. Um, and then you get, a, you get a tab here that shows you that particular rendering. So you could render multiple shots um, all in one go when you do your queue. But the main important part is that if you go to the unsaved configuration for the fighting, you get like a whole list of things that you can include into your rendering and and these are all like little tweaks you can do that give you a much nicer high level control over your render and allow you to produce um, visual quality that, that you just wouldn't be able to do down here at all. So this is a totally rewritten kind of tool that came out in 4.26 that is really the connection between 
how to get stuff rendered in real time to look like movie quality and uh, definitely a valuable tool to learn and get really familiar with uh, when you're producing content that you're going to render out. So one of the things I, I noticed or that I've learned that you can do is, for example, you can switch the, the rendering type to a different types of sequence or you can have multiple image sequences. Um, one of the options in here is to allow you to do console variables. Um, was that it? Console variables? And so in here, you can... Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> now I'm forgetting. Console variables. Um, there's anti-aliasing, which is also something we want to talk about. So we'll talk about anti-aliasing first, and then we'll come to the console variables, because it's actually a little more complicated. So what they're suggesting is to actually use none as your uh, anti-aliasing so that you're not getting lots and lots of different... Um, so you're not getting these game type of anti-aliasing where you're getting sort of artifacts and all that stuff. So if you use none and you increase your sample rate to 64, uh, you actually get a really nice high quality render in the end of the day. And the console variables is the part where you put in some commands. I think this is the right section. Um, where there is a, a set number of console variables that you can put in that you can find from the documentation. And I'll try to explain it. It's This is where, you know, your eyes glaze over and you're like, what are you doing? But um, I'll just explain it so that you have a, at least a, a basis of what's happening here. And uh, I put, oh, sorry, let me show you what I'm doing here. I'll put it in inside of render sequence rendering of the library folder. That's where you're going to find it if you're, in Slack and uh, I have like two this is a video that talks about how to use it which is really helpful and in here I've got the, the article that goes to the documentation on Unreal has for using the movie render queue which is got a lot of very nice content it was actually a really fancy video up here of showing demonstrating how ray trace rendering and they've got uh, really nice camera shots and uh, you know it's demonstrating how nice the render quality can be, but also how ray tracing works. And also what I really like about it is that the camera movements are nice. And they're, they're like clean and moving. But there's also this, this subtle like camera shake happening as if like somebody's actually like tracking a camera through space, which I mean, nobody would really ever notice this, but it's just that subtlety is so hard to do in CG that um, they must have either had some sort of awesome noise algorithm or they just motion captured a physical camera doing some of these movements so that they just captured that that subtlety but it's really really nice anyway um so here's documentation of how all this stuff that i'm trying to do works and then when you get down to um configuring anti-aliasing how here's this is doing what i'm just talking about there um console variables add some console variables uh, here's a bunch of different ideas of different settings that you could do. And wow, there's a whole bunch here that I'm not really aware of. But inside of the video, uh, this video, this guy just said to put... Um, oh shoot, where is it? Maybe they've changed the documentation since I last looked. I don't know. Oh, here it is. Temporal snapping. So they just said put these ones in um, and make them all zero. And I don't really know the logic. I guess I haven't honestly read it through very carefully. So uh, disabling the denoisers, I guess, is what we're trying to do. And there's lots to learn here, uh, which would be really good to uh, explore. But anyway, for the sake of being fun, we're going to go right to it. I actually have them in... Hmm. Where are we here? I actually have the, the, the commands here copied and pasted so that... You don't have to go and dig it out again but you would just basically take that code and put it in here and then make a new one and this is disabling the ambient occlusion denoiser the um, global illumination denoiser and I, I guess these ones are, are all causing artifacts on your renders so I don't know if you watch the video he has a really good demonstration of how like the before and after and you're like oh yeah no, those look really nice after 
I think the, the important part is the motion blur that they're solving, and I think that's the uh, that's the interesting thing, because especially in this animation we have a lot of motion blur, and if you don't quite get the motion blur right, then you're going to have a lot of um, weird artifacts. So we'll just do a render right now, and I'll show you what I mean. We're going to put this into, I guess, this folder, I don't know. So we'll do render local. I'll bring this over here. So you can see between each frame, there's like a whole bunch of sampling happening. So that's the 64 samples happening between each frame. And that is allowing us to, I think it's calculating, I mean, it's for the anti-aliasing, but I think it's also really helping with the motion blur um, and giving us a, a nice clean and honest render. But you can definitely see how like the time spent waiting for it is no longer nearly as fast as it used to be where you would have like a kind of real time movement before. Um, but now it's like taking almost like a full render, but still pretty fast in hindsight. I'm going to turn that off just in case that's using up a lot of processor speed. I've got like two projects going on in the background. I have, I've been totally missing my chat for a long time here. Hopefully I didn't miss anything. Okay. I just missed one of Audrey's comments about the fox. So what we're going to do is take a look at some of the images and then, uh, you know, I could compare it to the previous images, I guess, because I've done those as well. But uh, let's just take a look at it now since we're not, we don't need to wait till it's finished. So the movie renders are going in here and then the original renders are over here. Oh no, they're gone. Hmm. Bad. That I still had them. Okay, well, anyway, we'll just take a look at these renders. Oh, I think what's happening is I'm inside of the same folder. Hey, this is perfect. Then I can show you the before and after really well. Uh, <laughs> so it's the same frame twice. We've got the, the before and the after. Um, so you're really seeing some differences here for sure. Uh, like what I like about it right away is uh, the motion blur is really demonstrating where the direction is and it's blurring in the correct direction instead of like it's trying to create this may have been the denoisers that are causing these artifacts um, but it, it definitely you can see some differences but then what's happening here between the water and the background and where the legs are um, having that extra sampling time really allows it to fill in all that data so you get a nice cleaner sort of effect so you can definitely start to see where these changes are wow this is awesome i really managed to get lucky on demonstrating these two frames side by side for every single pose here anyway subtle stuff like this is really important when you're doing renders especially when you're coming from unreal and it, it sort of legitimizes the whole pipeline so then you can actually like justify doing final renders through Unreal instead of, you know, thinking, oh, geez, I wonder if I just rendered this with a marmoset or something more, I'd be able to get better results. And I think you could normally get a lot of these settings if you just knew all the console commands and how to tweak it in setting, but the fact that you can get them pretty easily and you can get pretty decent results that so you don't have to, like, think too much and, and just get those results is actually a lot of fun and kind of cool. Anyway, that was what I wanted to talk about today, so I'm glad I managed to get that covered pretty straightforward. Um, and it was also cool to see that Kieran was able to take that file and improve it drastically. Uh, I think what we're going to do is hold off on this one for a second here. Um, and we're going to come back to it and maybe try to find some ideas about how I'm going to do a backdrop. I don't know. if I'm, I'm still not sure if I'm going to do a backdrop or not. It's like, how do you... I gotta find an angle and do all those things without, you know, kind of looking super creepy. <laughs> it's like, hmm, how do I do that where I don't make it look super creepy? And unfortunately, like the whole landscape feels really like muddy and dirty, which is like just it's got a really like desaturated post processing filter on it, which maybe we could just manipulate, make it look less 
super desaturated. But I think if I put a campfire in there and I um, change the lighting, it would uh, it wouldn't really matter. And then you, maybe you could just be like at the top of this hill or something, looking back, like around here or something. Maybe if I'm gonna be looking with my back to the fire, it's kind of weird. Oh man, it always gets tricky, eh? Every time you want to do one of these things, lots of thinking involved. Riz, welcome back. Is that an actual photograph? <laughs> you mean this 3D environment that I'm running through? Yeah. Or are we talking about the renders that we were doing before? It would be awesome if uh, it was so good that you were like, is that a photograph? Uh, Audrey, it's where the witcher eats kids type of environment. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm going for. I don't want to be in this like cozy cottage with foxes and Christmas lights. I want to be where the Witcher is eating kids. Much better. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it sounded like a great idea at first. I mean, actually, this kind of would work better because you get that glow, and then you still get a nice backdrop, and then for some reason I'd have to build a chair here or something. I don't know whether I could be like somehow in a different spot. Oh, I've tried to do foreground stuff before. Oh, look at that nice sword. That's really nice. And for, for whatever reason, from that angle, it looked like it was very, very shiny. Uh, but I've tried to do foreground stuff before, but it doesn't really work very well. You'd have to really tighten up the shot, and then... Uh, for some reason, justify why I'm sitting by this anvil. <laughs> and then we'd have, like, really dark contrast. But I'd have to be able to put, like, a red light on my face a little more. I don't know if a red light on my face is, is necessarily what I want. As I'm doing all my Q&As and everything. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, we got one other thing we want to do today which uh, is helping Jake with his project. So it's kind of an interesting um, change of pace as we're going to go from looking at pretty things to talking about game design. Well, not yeah, game design, but uh, game logic, I guess, is better. And so um, we've got a, he's got a pretty neat project going on that, uh, I mean, it's very basic at this, at this point, but what's really neat about it is, is the the implementing the logic behind it and it's it's at a level where i think we can kind of trail in the information but he also needs a fix to it so we can go through the fix and uh and work our way through solving it but also discuss how we're moving variables around so it's going to get a little more technical because this is a technical stream um but uh then we'll go back when we got some time and see if we can get one of those shots figured out once I have a little bit of time to think about what I'm doing with it and uh, see if we can come up with something. Okay, so what Jake has for a project is uh, he's got two projects going on, but this one's sort of like a very simple basic version of what his other project is, just sort of the core principles. And what we were working on was uh, trying to figure out the logic of how to, well, he already has the logic working, but uh, really solving some bugs and issues where the character here um, can actually change to different oh no I can't actually change to different characters must be not able to do that at the moment anyways doesn't matter so I'm able to pick up this blue key which allows me to go through a doorway which you can't even see the doorway but uh, if I hit E uh, it does actually open the door and I go into another level and in this level there's another doorway which we can't see but we're gonna fix that and then you hit E, and because I picked up the blue key, it allows me to uh, go back to the previous level. So it only happens because I have that blue key. Um, if I played this again and walked over this door and hit E, um, it doesn't let me do it. So that's where we were last time I talked. And then he has a, a, a question about um, how to get the door open. Oh, shoot. This is going to be trouble if uh, I don't am not able to switch characters. <laughs> uh, we may have to solve lots of problems. 
Let's see here. His question was, uh, keeping the last character you had possessed as you go through the door. Well, that was the challenge. So we've got to solve even how to get the character to be multiple characters. So that's that's another thing that we can definitely talk about and cover, which will be kind of interesting to cover. And then we'll do that for about 30 minutes, I guess, and we'll see where we're at. And then we'll go back to maybe something a little different if it's getting kind of dry. So we're going to get into the character blueprint of this particular character. Um, which is a uh it's the knight well maybe that's why it's not working maybe we should be the blueprint parent because the knight is a child of the blueprint parent and in here we have all of the inputs that would be specific to this character let's open up the blueprint parent and see what that looks like this is definitely going to get technical. <laughs> We're going to go from, yeah, that was fun stuff to like, oh my goodness, what are we doing? Uh, just because you're jumping right in the middle of a lot of complicated stuff here. But let's let's try to keep it loose and talk about the overview first before I get too deep into the troubleshooting. Um, one of the... One of the cool things that we've got going on here, I feel like there's a sequencer open. Let's close that. Um, is that uh, these blueprint assets, they're exposed with special like custom attributes, which are really neat because you can customize each of the balls to be different easily. So this key type exposed variable because it's got that little eyeball on it, which you can just turn on and off. Um, allows you to see it from inside of the editor. So if I grabbed that same type of assets and I put one over here, I can change it to green and it would actually be green. So that would be considered itself a green key instead of a blue key, which is very cool. And uh, I think the logic inside of here is basically just when you overlap uh, and you are the player, then cast to the game instance. So that's something I was going to get to. Uh, game instance is a really neat concept where you can store variables that, sh that you can transfer between levels uh, and maintain through the game. So inside of the project assets, under maps and modes, there's an option down here to do game instance. And I just kind of learned about that when Jake did it. So I didn't, I've been trying to put stuff in game modes, but, uh, game instance class is pretty cool too and there's lots of other places you can store um, variables that transfer around but uh, I kind of like that there's a special one just for this purpose so inside of this game instance uh, blueprint which you can just create uh, just from any new blueprint uh, game I don't know if it's in the defaults here game instance uh, you can make a new game instance but I don't need to make a new one so this is the one that we've created already and it's got a few variables in here then they're all exposed so I don't know if it being exposed is necessarily important but it's definitely like these are the values that are gonna stay within the game between levels and so to, to access these and to change these uh, what we're doing and particularly from this blueprint <clears throat> where you're picking up the key <clears throat> sorry um, we've got uh, we get game instance and so that little function is pretty handy because you can just get game instance from anywhere and uh, call that particular file and so from the game and so we have to cast to it so that we can pull some value variables from it so you just from here we can drag out and find um all the variables that are inside of this blueprint and that's kind of a core concept that we always kind of work with for how to talk to other blueprints and so what we're doing is we're adding a new key to that array so this little icon is an array we're adding this key type to it um and uh and i guess the adding is also saving it to the to the instance for you 
And then we're destroying this actor, which is the ball actor. So we're, we're saving over to the instance and then destroying ourselves. Um, and that's allowing us to maintain player keys as a value as we jump between level to level. And having this key type exposed with uh, three different instances. Oh, I'm not sure how he's doing that. Maybe those are the enumerators. Oh yeah, E key type. Go check it out. There it is. E key type is an enumeration, which is just a, a ability to have a list of objects. So I could always add another object. Um, yellow, for example, and save it. And because it's using that enumeration inside of the, um, this is that particular type of enumeration. Uh, we should be able to see yellow in the list now. So enumerators are easy to make as well. They're just part of the objects that you're allowed to create. Uh, what are they in? Miscellaneous or something? Oh shoot, I forget where do they find them. Blueprints? Oh, there's enumeration. This is another cool way to store data between, um, uh, to have a list of data that you can call. I mean, we're talking pretty high level complicated problems, but these are kind of the kind of tricks that I found when I was learning uh, that you're just like, if you don't know about them, you're just not even aware to, uh, to, to even use that technique or when it comes, when it's appropriate. So just knowing that they exist is like, oh, that's a better way to deal with this problem. Okay, so moving on, we're gonna get into, uh, we got the key sorted. There's no problems with the key anyways. So we're gonna also the door. Okay, so there's the door asset, which we're gonna go and explore. So the door asset used to have this ability to open and close a door mesh, but you don't actually have a mesh to work with. So I'm not sure how that works. Like I think there used to be a static mesh. Maybe there's one in here. Yeah, door frame, door, looks good. All right, we have a door. Whoops, not in the right place. And uh, <laughs> the orientation doesn't make any sense. We'll just put it here. There, it's a door. Uh, you can always just add more meshes and stuff. They're just available in here. Static meshes or skeletal meshes. But what we're trying to do is take that door and I think it's supposed to rotate. So we've got this, uh, this is a timeline piece. This is a timeline. You can always just create a timeline, add a timeline and in here you can double click on them and go inside and make some animation curves with them. So uh, over a period of two seconds in this case, we're gonna have the door rotate from zero to 120. I guess we're working our way to 90. So, not sure, we're kind of ending at 145 degrees, which seems a bit weird, but we'll see. Um, and that would change every update. It changes the rotation of the door uh, offset root. Oh, okay, so we have the offset root here. Let's see what the offset root looks like when we rotate it. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. So in theory, our door is, uh, not anywhere near where it's supposed to be. <laughs> I almost feel like it's the collision object that's in the wrong place. Maybe we should put the door right here. So that it pivots nicely on the corner. 
and then we'll move the collision object which is detecting whether the player is inside of the door or not so like about here what does that look like oh i've got it backwards guess we can just rotate the door around we'll put it here he's walking into a door of unknown Uh, and we'll go back to the event graph and so that will every single update of this curve as it goes through is going to keep rotating that door open and closed um, and we're going to put in a rotator uh, amount from the uh, the value and to the Z let's let's just try it out that will only happen if I don't know I feel like it'll always happen so let's just try it out Oh, it didn't happen. Oh yeah, so the E, oh yeah, this is a whole other confusing part that I only barely understand. If I don't have that key, uh, then uh, let me let me just play it again. I'll pick up the key and then I hit E. Um, there we go, now the door is opening. And that door is not in the right place, because I've moved it. Also, I think the collision volume should be for both sides. Because I'm realizing that I might be entering the door two different dimensions. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about with what I'm so mysteriously uh, baffled by, which might actually make sense today. I don't know. We're inside of the door open blueprint, and there is an option here that we're saying that says disable input. So, under the right circumstances, that the character uh, overlaps or begins overlapping the box, we're going to the game instance and we're checking things well actually we're building a widget not sure why we're doing any of this stuff actually doesn't really seem logical um, we're adding the widget to the viewport so our, our HUD uh, and then we're deciding whether or not the required key type is oh does it know what this is Oh, the required key type is this uh, open variable. There we go. This is fun. So we've got the door. You pick the door. Here's our required key type. So again, you have custom variables exposed on your blueprint. And you can say, oh, you have to have a yellow key to get through this door. But instead, we have it set to blue. And uh, and then what the name of the level is that uh, you're going to teleport to. So um, we're just teleporting to test level, which we can talk about in a sec. I mean, basically, your destination is another enumerator. So that's just your level enumerator, a list of names. And uh, it's using that, that word to dictate which level to open, which happens somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where. Anyways, if the key required type is equal to none, then we say true and we enable input, meaning allow you can hit AE key in your box volume and if it's false then we go to um oh if it's false then we go find out what our what does the player have what's in their pockets and then we go oh we've got a loop through all the different keys they have in their pocket and see if it does match this required key type which um may be set to blue in this case that's kind of cool and if it's true then we enable input allowing you to hit e when you're inside the volume, which activates the interaction up here, which goes, um, well, it says hello, just for troubleshooting purposes. But this is really going to be your teleport selection. So for some reason, it's asking whether the door is closed or not. So it's deciding whether to close the door, or open the door. Uh, probably would say doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason why it's like that. I guess in theory the door could be open, so you could say play and play from start. Anyways, I'm not gonna get into that. So, um, so if you hit it and the and the animation finishes, which it does, then it goes through here, uh, and it uh, you get the player controller, and we're updating the uh, the index of which character is. This is actually the part that 
uh, Jake is asking me a question about it, so this is kind of relevant to, to look in deeply here. We're updating the uh, the character index that is uh, located that is being chosen from the player controller. So uh, without getting into too much chaos here, we open up the player controller, which is like one step up from the character blueprint, which is one step below above the loop animation blueprint. So there's like multiple blueprints hierarchy here. Um, the player controller, which you can always make a custom player controller blueprint, or you could just use the default one, has uh, the option to switch characters, which is the part that's currently not working for me. Um, but maybe that's part of the problem why it's not working. Uh, and in the controller here, we have uh, the character index. So in theory, what you can do is hit J and it will jump between different characters. So there's three or four different, three, three different characters that you can switch to while you're playing. Um, I'd show you how it works, but it's broken. But uh, this stores the index. So we're, we're keeping track of which character number we're using. And this gets into a whole lots of fancy fun stuff that uh, I'm not even talking about right now. Uh, so we'll just try to ignore that. Um, and then what are we doing here? We go to the set transformation of the actor on. So when we do a character switch, uh, it's actually destroying the original character, spawning a new character on the same spot, uh, matching the transform to what we just set it to. Here's our index and our actors. So the actors, I guess, is a preset array um, of, of uh, blueprint child uh, character blueprints. So we got the three different character blueprints. And um, collision handling override. So it's spawning a new character of that type, uh, whatever the actor is that was decided to, well, it'll just iterate down. So every time you hit the button, it'll just go to the next one. Cast upon. Uh, oh, interesting. We're casting to pawn so that we possess the pawn. So now we're possessing this newly spawned character. So you are becoming the player. And then we're hiding the uh, focus, update focus. Oh, okay. We're just updating the interface, which is something else. Game at X. Switching is a uh, input. So let me show you where the inputs are for everybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about. The input is uh, inside of the project settings. So we have interact, which is the E button. We have uh, jump is a whole bunch of different options. Move right is a whole bunch of options. We have axis mappings and we have action mappings axis mappings does like a range of values as you you know like an analog input and then action mappings is sort of a digital input where either you're pressing the button or not pressing the button uh like here's you know even if you're hitting keyboard a it's still giving you a one or a zero but it's technically you you have a range potentially from an input um, I'm still not really seeing the J key, so that might be the problem here. We're not, we're not getting that, uh, I'm not getting one that's called switching. Oh, this isn't actually a, uh, input, is it? It's a custom. Hmm. All right. Let's find, see if I can find some references to this. Uh, find references. This one's calling switching, so what's happening here? Nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing that. Here's switching. Begin play, switching. Okay, well, I think this is where you're supposed to be doing the switching, but uh, it's not connected, so I'm not sure if that's meant to be disconnected or what. I feel like I should just switch this to uh, the key button that we're going to make. Let's try it out. We go to project settings, back in here again to the inputs. We're going to make one that's called switch. So we'll say 
switch player. I guess we should make it more descriptive. And originally it was the J key, so we're gonna put the J key in here. And uh, oh, that's it. That's all you have to do. Now we should be able to find, hopefully, uh, switch player. There it is. Sometimes you'll find that grabbing these inputs from Blueprint doesn't work. Uh, it's because of the the logic of whether that asset is available for uh, clicking a button. So, like, I don't think you can find switch player inside of a blueprint. Let me just test this theory, though. Oh, see, I was wrong. Put action switch player. I don't know. Sometimes you can't find that stuff in certain areas. And so you can only use these inputs from uh, particular blueprints. And sometimes Unreal will do that, especially with the blueprints. So it'll kind of limit you for what you can do inside of a blueprint, just to make sure that you're doing it in the correct logical way. It's important when you're getting into level blueprints too, because that's very much sort of specific to that level and it's very much controlled. You can't really talk to a level blueprint. You can only talk from a level blueprint. Anyways, let's see if this actually works. All right, I'm gonna hit J. We're definitely getting our own character over and over again. So that's something at least. Kind of means that we are our own character. Um, we just have to change the index, which is what this was for. So uh, maybe, maybe we should be doing this instead. So we'll switch up, and then that will cause this switching to call this switching, which is the custom event. All right, let's try this. There we go. Now we're becoming different characters. And um, so the challenge is when I grab a blue key and I am this character and I enter the door by hitting E and I go to another world, I am now not that character anymore. So that is the bug. That I was supposed to solve here. So, uh, it's probably just going to happen right around this area because we know what actor we have. We know what character index. Or I, the actress is kind of irrelevant. We know what character index uh, we have, and that is the value I think that needs to be stored in the um, the instance. The Shoot, what's it called again? <laughs> you know, that blueprint thing that saves all the keys. That thing. Um, game instance. So, I would almost argue that this character index should maybe even exist in the char in the other one. Um, it does mean we'd have to keep calling it over and over again. It's kind of a pain in the butt. But, maybe that's, maybe that's not such a big deal. Let's see how many times it's been called. We'll go to, uh... wait, I can't do this. Character index, find references, here we go. All right, it's been called quite a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so switch down. Okay, I'm not really using switch down right now. That's not really counting. Oh, and then we're setting it. Here we're calling it and we're setting it. Here we're using it. Oh yeah, we're using it here as well. So here's, this is the, the dash. This is to get fuel. And I think all these commands have been potentially optimized. You get a health, adds the health, but that doesn't necessarily store the health into the proper loop instance here so we want to put them into here instead of over here all right we have a whole very uh challenging problem ahead of us here because um 
what we're trying to do is take a lot of these values, this value, this value, and this value, and put them all into the game instance. Uh, and every, I think it's every tick. Oh, this is a loop. That's what it is. Every five seconds, half a second, I mean, this goes through in a circle. You can see it. And once it's done, it comes back around, waits half a second, comes here and does it over again. And what it's doing is regenerating the health of the character. So um, every time I set it, I probably should be setting it to um, the, uh, the game instance. Since it happens every half second, it's actually pretty good. And in theory, I could probably be doing uh, setting other variables as well, like setting this stuff. And I feel like what I want to do is is make it into a smarter system than like calling the thing over and over again. I could make it into like a function that sort of runs easily. Um, and basically you call it and it will just store all these variables at once. I think that's kind of a good way to do it. So we'll still have these local variables, but we'll just make it sync to game instance. Um, but how do we make it so that when we load a level, it will load up all those values? I don't, I don't think um, it would be on begin play. I think that you'd have to do that. So here's our begin play. So this sounds really complicated, but I think it's actually going to be fairly straightforward. But I always say that before I start something that's really, really hard. <laughs> um, why do I do this to myself? Uh, so what we're going to do is get game instance. And uh, we're going to use that to cast to this my game instance, which is where we should be storing these variables. And uh, we're not even worried about how we're going to trigger this because I'm going to put this into a function. But from here, uh, we want three values. So we want to store focus, health, and character index. Let's see if there's anything else. Actors will be... Well, I mean, in theory. No, it doesn't matter. Actors doesn't change, so that should be fine. Uh, set transform, shouldn't matter. So these are the three variables that we want to store. Uh, and we're just going to go through the process of saving each of them. But in here, we should find all these things as well. So focus, um, these are the focuses, these are the variables that are inside of the game instance, not the ones that are inside of this value. They just happen to be there already. And luckily I didn't have to create them. Uh, so those are the three variables. We're gonna make sure that they pass the values across. Luckily, they're all the correct values. These little, um, these are cool value variables, by the way. If you ever look at the list of different types of variables you can create, these are the normal single var uh, variables. And then this is just a simple array. This is a set. This is a map dictionary. So you get to choose what the key type is, what kind of like attribute variable type you want for the key, and then what the type of variable you want for like the, the value that you're gonna assign to that key. And uh, it's actually really handy and really neat. So we're, we've made it so that integers of 0, 1, 2, 3 for each of the characters uh, stores a float. So each um, each character has their own float data, which represents the, um, well, it depends if the focus or the health or the, well, the character index is different. So it was kind of a cool idea. We're gonna make a sequence here, which is just a set of different executes. And we're gonna pump off each one so that we can get them all stored. And then we'll, I'm just gonna take this and throw it into a function. So you can collapse all this into a function. And we're gonna call this function where is it? Here it is. Uh, oh, I just double clicked on it. We're going to call it uh, store values to 
game instance. So you can't deny what it does, except for when it doesn't rename it. All right, so that's gonna be what this is called. And in here, what we're doing is we're just getting the game instance, doing all the things, everything can exist in here. Uh, we don't have to do very much. Uh, you know, in theory, I could add values to pass into this function, but I don't even need to do that because I've got all the values inside. And, uh, and we'll just keep calling this function over and over again from different places. But if we need to add or change anything, we'll just come in here and um, make one change to the function and then it'll get reproduced everywhere. So for example, we're gonna call it here and then we'll call it, actually, why do we don't need to call it twice. We're gonna go through the same loop no matter what. Maybe what we'll do is we'll add another, add another pin afterwards, I suppose, even though it looks a little messy. Um, so after we're done changing these things, we'll we'll store all of it. That will happen every half a second. And then we also want to do it when this event tick is just basically updating the, the values to the to the HUD screen. And uh, we're what are we doing here? We're getting health, so we're adding a value. So this would be a good spot for it. So we'll throw it in here. Throw it in here. Now what's happening here? We got dash. That's actually, oh, it seems to be changing stuff. I don't remember what, I don't even have a button for dash. So somewhere in here, it makes sense that I'm doing stuff. I don't know, change, update, focus. Probably want to put it in here somewhere. <laughs> Not really, not that it matters, but you know, in theory, this has to be put in here as well. Although if I missed it, it probably would matter because it would get done anyways every half second. Uh, and then begin play. Okay, so then begin play, we actually have a different problem. Now we gotta load, um, load these values up as opposed to save them. Uh, here we're actually setting the character uh, index, so I also have to switch and store the new character index change. And then we switch the character, which probably doesn't. Ooh, never mind. I don't think any of this stuff is necessary here. We're doing it on every tick, every half second. Maybe it's important, I don't know. If we did though, we should probably have made a, shared it, because it's just happening here as well. No, it's happening every tick. So what are we doing here? We're just updating the HUD. Yeah, we don't need these. <laughs> Says the guy who confidently deletes everything. Uh. And then we're not changing anything, so we'll just keep moving along. Sarah, been trying to pay attention, but phone has been going crazy. I've not been able to catch up. What are you up to? Yeah, well, that's going to make it really tough because it's been pretty dry. <laughs> it's good, though. We're, we're talking about some really basic sort of logic between moving attributes in a game environment. Um, and I'm trying to be very thorough about explaining what's happening because it's kind of a fun little project that... Uh, you know, I think it comes across a lot of similar issues when you have when you make any kind of game. At the very best or worst, it's uh, it's just it's exploring some of the, the things you can do inside of blueprints. All right, we're not going to do anything in the pause game, so let's just go with that. Now I got to do is deal with the begin play. So when we start beginning the game, um, we're going to make sure that we load all the variables before we. Uh, uh, before we do this, that's for sure. And then it's going to trigger the start regeneration, which just basically begins that loop that happens up here. So it's like, get going, and then it just keeps going in a circle forever. All right, so we're going to put, we have to put it before switching though, because we're going to decide which character we're going to switch to. 
So um, it's going to be the same sort of idea. Maybe I should just put switching at the bottom. Where I, uh, I kind of do what I already did for um, storing the variables. This time I'm going to do it in reverse. So I'm just going to duplicate this. We're going to call this load. Dave, welcome. Uh, telling Sarah to turn off the phone. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so important. You should turn off your phone. Just focus on me. I've got such important things to say. Um, so let's go back to our, our event graph. We've made a duplicate for load values into game instance. Uh, somehow decided to name it zero. And so I'm going to open that up. And we're going to change this so that instead of doing it where we're uh, storing the values, we're going to load the values. It's going to be kind of a bit weird. We'll say set here, and then we're going to go get focus. Might be easier just to uh, get rid of these. Simplicity. It's going to look very similar. It's just the wires are going to be slightly different. And the nice thing is that like as you sort of build the game and stuff, you could just keep expanding this idea. Uh, character index, see if I can do this without making a mistake. Set. All right, so it's nice and neat and tidy. We should be happy. It should be the same story. We're just like set, set, set. Or sorry, load, load, load. Whatever. Same thing. And we go back to the beginning and we're going to throw that into here. We're loading the values. And compile and save. Um, let's just see what happens. Whoa, I didn't know I could jump. That was fun. Uh, I'm going to hit J. So we want this character to try and store when we come over. E. Hey, look at that. It just worked. First try. How oh, cool. Let's try being this character. And E. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, the door is not in the right place. <laughs> All right, hold on a sec. We have thousands of levels. None of them work. All right, so the player spawns from the spawn location here, which is just not quite where the door is. I'm going to move the door over here. Save. Um, I could play it from here, but I have to give the person a key. So let's give ourselves a key. Important that I don't grab the material. I'm grabbing the blueprint. And I make that a blue key. Okay, so I go to the door, hit E, nothing happens. I go to the... Oh, look, I'm even... Oh, I must be an ambient idol. There we go. Uh, we go back to the door again and hit E, and then the door opens. Now I'm back here, and I'm the right kind of character. We're going to switch to this person. I'm going to jump over this key. Hit E. We can still open it. We still got the blue key. We're still the same character. Nice. It's working. Um, man, there's like all kinds of things I could probably go from here. Like, let's fix that ambient idle problem. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's important right now. 
<laughs> I remember last time I looked at it, I was like, oh, we should do it this way, and then I got lost into a giant sidetracked problem. All right, I think we solved that problem. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to something a little different just for keeping things entertaining. But uh, we are definitely storing the values into that um, blueprint, which was kind of cool, um, which I can't find anymore. This one in my game instance. So you could just keep adding more and more content like that and uh, storing all kinds of game assets and values in there. OK, I guess I should package this up for Jake, although he probably would just prefer to use it through the uh... So this, this is a great way to zip up your projects for anyone who doesn't realize this. Um, you zip it from inside of the Unreal package project zip up project and that way you get all the right editor files that they're going to need. But it also conveniently gets rid of all the stuff you don't need. So in this folder, we have derived data cache, intermediate saved. Um, but inside of the zip, it strips it all out. It just gives you only the stuff you need. So you got the config for your key controls, you got all the content in here, and then you got your U project, which is the thing you're gonna run from. So um, you'll save yourself lots of data space, and um, which, I mean, it looks like Jake did it too, so that's good. Let's see how big this thing is. It's exactly the same size. Way to go. Anyways, it's a great way to do it because it keeps it clean. Because a lot of these, the val all the values inside of these folders are just necessary to your local computer. So you don't need to give them to other people to open the project. OK, uh, let's go back to the fun stuff. Well, I guess I haven't closed the project yet. Uh... All right. I've got 20 minutes to sort this out. Uh, one thing I was trying to figure out was I like having some kind of like seat, like even in mine, I have like this chair, fake chair here. That looks like my seat, even though it's not. It'd be nice if I could come up with some kind of chair or seat or something. I don't know if they have any of those assets in here. Bench. Can't see the bench though. I'm not sure if I'm going to find anything. I might just have to be like, oh, well, I guess I could put, oh, here's that uh, eye thing. I never did figure out what this thing did. Lines. That's roof to allow the environment artist to. How do I play it? Oh, I bet you there was a mode that said play it with the uh, options on. Choose got sword chair <laughs> I should make a chair out of swords that would be pretty cool oh yeah the chair out of swords yeah 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 the eye of siren traveling I'm trying to think of how that would work yeah the game of thrones chair I know what you're talking about that would be uh that would take me more than 20 minutes to get that ready it's like all right duplicate the swords 500 times uh welcome to the tourist mode in this mode we'll f f explore some of the finer points of how the scene was assembled use the scroll wheel to change the time of day oh i can change the time of day just sitting here Ooh, that is pretty cool I am now deep into the nighttime here. Oh, there's the sun rising. Wow, it's really misty in the morning. Or maybe it takes a while for the mist to kind of like pass through. Wow, that is pretty awesome. The fact that it got so misty. Or maybe the second day is a misty day. I don't know. It's pretty amazing. Let's just put an Ikea chair inside of this medieval town. Why not, right? Why do you gotta be like all medieval like? We have some baskets and stuff. Creepy Scarecrow. To achieve the functionality of the Creepy Scarecrow, we used a simple recently rendered check to select when it should be moving or still. Combined with EQS, we can determine the current creepiest position to locate it accordingly. 
Huh? <laughs> what? That was the creepiest location? It was the same location as last time. I guess they just determine if you're not looking at it until you got over there. If I didn't look that direction until I passed it, maybe it would come back and look at me from a different direction. I don't know. Whatever. It is cool. Creepy though. Not gonna lie. I was a little creeped out when I first saw it. If you squint, if you squint maybe it's creepy. The Ikea chair? <laughs> yeah. Uh, or maybe you're talking about the scarecrow. Because... Time of day. To set the mood in <laughs> the simple time of day, system was built that would allow artists to specify the look settings at the given point in the time and interpolate between accordingly. Yeah, that's right. As I was walking along, the time of day was changing rapidly. Put that signpost in there. Never did look at this town over here, this house over here. I noticed that they keep reusing the same assets, and that's very smart because it's definitely minimizing the amount of cost that's going to be involved. You can figure out ways to like just keep using those same ones. Yeah, definitely the time of day seems different. Template houses to handle fast interactions on the houses and structures across the scene. A template actor blueprint was used to put together to load each building from a simple sublevels before being collapsed down to their current form of for release. I'd like to say I know what that means, but I don't. But it would be kind of interesting to see what the template actor looks like. Wait, what? They're not even, um, not even a blueprint. Just a bunch of individual assets. Huh? Handle the iteration. To handle fast iteration on the houses and structures across the scene, a template actor blueprint was put together to load each building from a simple from simple sublevels, sublevels. Oh, okay. Maybe they're talking about like I was thinking levels in a house, but they might be talking about like levels. Ah, here we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We got a lot of stuff. So it's actually nice to see they're actually using levels. Most of the time, I see level uh, projects and like. Nobody's using these things, but they're actually really uh, Like from a pipeline standpoint, they're really useful because everybody can just sort of focus on their own level Oh post process. Ah, it's the post process that's changing the exposure Of course, I never even thought of that Oh lighting version 2 I think we need the lighting. The houses are all still here, even though... Oh, wait, that one's not there. Oh, there's a house. So that house is on a level. Interesting. So house three, there should be a level called house three. Let's just do a filters for levels. Yeah, there they are. So those are all the different levels, and you can just open them up individually. Mm, let's not save it. There it is. So that's how levels works: is you just you've got a, a bunch of levels that you can merge into one level, and then you know the only problem is you have to be very aware of which level is which and people working on it have to be aware of which level is which because uh is this the main one uh because when you first drop an asset in it's probably not going to go in the level that you think it will and uh you know if you want to see your environment with your level then uh you kind of want to be working inside of the main project 
So if I go back to the main one, oh, not layers, levels. Oh, I always have levels there. Good. Um, and we used to use this in Unreal 3 as well, but it, uh, it's just not very well utilized because everyone gets really confused. So if you want an object, like one of these levels, you have to make current, um, and then it'll be the highlighted one. And then if you take like an asset over here, you can say, I want to, uh, well, I guess you would say, take the selected object and move selected actors to this level. So you can like shift assets between levels if you want to, but um, you can see how this gets really confusing for people because it'd be like, oh, I'm just gonna throw something in the level. But usually the persistent level is the, is the current one. So everything ends up going into the persistent level, um, which it looks like there is quite a lot of stuff here for the persistent level. And uh, you just have to be aware of how that works. Anyway, kind of cool that they even brought that up in the discussion of how this project works. Let's hit G to get rid of all this junk. Now I've lost my path. Not only am I disoriented, but I also don't know where. Oh, here we go. This was where it was. I had the eye there. I'm cheating now. Maybe I can just start from current camera location. That's not gonna work. It goes to the menu. It'd be kind of interesting to see how the menu works. We should go take a look at the level blueprint. I'm running out of time. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get to the uh, the idea for the camera thing, but I am really interested and in see how this is working. It's really cool. Developer commentary. No, I still start really far away. All right, let's take a look at the level blueprint. Nothing. Let's see, when you got multiple levels, you also have lots of sub level blueprints. Is there anything in here that might be looking like it's, oh, gameplay, there we go. The gameplay has a level blueprint. Oh, it's all disconnected though. So, which is interesting. So cast your game mode, main menu, destroy creepy scarecrow. <laughs> uh, fire trigger. I mean, I guess if the Scarecrow was being spawned in different locations all the time, that would kind of freak you out. Because you're like, whoa, what's it doing over here? I thought it was over there. But so far, I've only seen it in the same place twice. Um, smoke, fire, particle component, set visibility to true. Don't know what that's all about. So there's a blueprint called Game Mode Main Menu. Let's take a look at that. Why is the scarecrow on the roof? <laughs> See, that's pretty funny because I used to work on a horror game. Well, it was like, it's been four years working on a horror game. And uh, it never ended up getting released. So it was always kind of like, you know, a large portion of my career was spent working on things that never nobody ever got to see. But um, it was a open sandbox horror game, and the one problem with this this concept is that um, if you if you try to scare somebody, it's really hard to do it in a sandbox environment because you know there's all these unpredictable elements are happening. Like it's like trying to make a horror game out of Grand Theft Auto. Um, like you know it's hard to scare people when a they can go wherever they want but also b like random events happen that are just ridiculous um and we had like dogs and stuff and like zombie people and things that are supposed to scare you but when they got stuck on stuff or they like they you know like for example if they were on the roof and they spawned on the roof it would just be like it's just hilarious like you're just like this is stupid so it was the main struggle point was to stop laughing during our game reviews because we just have the most ridiculous scenarios and you're like, yeah, that wasn't scary at all. 
So if you ever decide to make a scary game, be careful. Uh, Audrey says, I don't know if GTA Chaos mode is pretty intense. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's funny. Well, I mean, GTA is like the most polished of those sandbox games, uh, especially after like all these years of like uh, fine tweaking it with online play and everything. But um, it's a uh, it's just an enormous amount of work to get a sandbox game working. It's just crazy. Like you just can't, uh, you can't really fully understand how complicated it is until you, you're just deep into development. Just because the player can just screw it all up by making one wrong turn. Audrey, I will never, I can't handle more than my little pony level of scare. <laughs> That's a pretty low level. Pretty sure this it's be tough to find anything that's remotely scary in my little pony. <laughs> Dave thought that was funny. All right, uh, I'm looking for this game mode thing here. BP map game mode main menu. BP game mode main menu. Why do we have two of them? And how is that even possible? You're not even supposed to be able to have two of the same assets. Am I filtering the search or something? Weird. Let's see what's going on here. Menu login. Start. Audrey says, everything is. My own reflection especially. <laughs> nice. That was awesome. I mean, terrible. That's not a terrible thing to say. Uh, next camera. New, new menu looping. How does it even get to the menu that's what I want to know like it's so bizarro like first of all what's your default player state game based state uh, on class is just first person player character camera fade stop camera fade delay see this is really interesting to me because this is kind of like stuff I was trying to do for my backdrop where you like change backdrops for a fade this is um, start camera fades, stop camera fades. Those are really neat ways to like uh, control the the view if you wanted to switch between transition between different view like cinematics or out of cinematics and stuff. Once we kicked off the loop, add the main menu widget to the viewport. Oh, there's our main menu. Once we kicked off the loop. What loop? Oh, this is a loop. There we go. Oh yeah, right. That's the loop of the different camera shots. Delay, 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 and then it shows a different shot. Delay, delay, delay. How do they choose which camera shot to show? Where's that list of shots? Get next camera. Blueprint. It's a function. And in here we have cached cameras. That is not an array that is populated. So somehow they're populating that cached cameras. Get all actors of class with tag. Main menu. Oh, okay. There, it's populating the, the cameras there. Everything that has a tag main menu. So um, oh, layers. Can we find cameras in here? There they are. Camera menu. So to put a tag on an object, you just, uh, somewhere near the bottom here, just type tag. There it is. You can just type whatever name you want in there, and then there's a, a function here that you can find them via the tag and collect them into a thing. So you get your cache cameras, and we do kind of what we did before. You go through the length, integer, go through them all. Uh, whoa, it's removing some? Uh, I don't quite get it. I've only got two minutes left. I just noticed the time. So, um... Uh, where was it here? What was the other last thing I did here? Once we came to the main menu of the widget, I'm curious to see what the widget looks like, but... Let's just see. Main menu widget. Here it is. Oh, we even have options. How many widgets do we have? 
main menu and main menu graphics. Cool. Oh yeah, there's our play and stop and stuff. So you might want to steal this if you ever wanted to do how to do a menu interface for your project. Might be a kind of a cool concept to start from. I'm sure it's been done in a way that is uh, pretty useful. And uh, just take a look at how exactly it uh, sends off commands to do, whoa, two different things. Like, begin experience. That'd be kind of cool. All right, so I'll leave it there. Um, Thanks again for everybody who showed up and had a chat with me. Um, I guess my backdrop is going to have to wait, uh, or maybe I'll do it offline. I always say I'm going to do stuff offline, and I never do because I'm always too busy. But uh, we'll see. I definitely need to change the backdrop eventually. But uh, we'll, we'll keep taking a look at that. And uh, thanks again for everybody who showed up. Um, I will be back again next week trying to uh, figure out some more battles of technical stuff. And so I will leave it there and see you then. All right, take care, everybody.